I've um, been contemplating. We took the best part of three weeks off. Um, it was cool. Time on a boat, time with my girl, time with our family, etc., etc., etc. Time on a beach. And I've spent a lot of time thinking. And I've been contemplating. How do we help people flourish in life? That's what it's about. Because Jesus definitely came that we would have eternal life. Are you with me on that? Let's all help the preacher. Are you with me on that? But I'm also convinced that he came that we might have abundant life. That we actually experience the kingdom here on earth. That we don't just have to wait until we actually get to heaven to experience favor and blessing. It's for us here and now. Are you with me on that? And, and, and I've really been seeking God and, and looking at, at ways in which we can move ourselves to a place of readiness to receive God's blessing and his favor and that season of flourishing in life. And I keep coming back to the basics. Sometimes we complicate our faith. Sometimes we complicate life and church. And I kept spinning around this one thought, and I'm going to take, it, take you with me on a journey today, because the catalyst for many of us that requires the intervention of heaven in our ministries, perhaps in our personal life or our family, in our business, maybe in our Church life, I'm sure all of us want the church to be strong. Our theme for 2018 is we, the church. It's time we actually started celebrating who we are. Jesus said, I will build my church. And uh, I think, you know, we, we want to see the church to flourish. We want to see a spiritual healing and an awakening in this nation of Australia that so desperately needs God. Are you with me on that? And so I keep going, God, help people flourishing. See them do well in business, in life, in their studies. I want to see the church to go. And, and you know what I come back to? We have to pray. We have to pray. Can't ignore it. So let me make it really simple. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. I'm going to give it to you in a few different versions. It's a really small verse. But let me give it to you in four or five different versions of the same verse. The NIV puts 1 Thessalonians 5 in, in simply pray continually. Pray continually. The New King James Version says, read it with me. Pray without ceasing. The, the contemporary English version, and never stop praying. The, how many people still have a good news Bible? Good news Bible says pray at all times. The amplified takes a little longer. Be unceasing and persistent in all prayer. Do you get the message? We have to Pray. No matter how you look at it, we, God's people, need to commit to the spiritual discipline of prayer. Why pray? Because the Bible says that we should pray. And guess what? Prayer works. Prayer works. So in the Old Testament, there's a story of answered prayer. I'm going to invite you to come with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1. There's a woman in there, a wonderful woman, a woman worth celebrating. Her name is Hannah. Yeah. <laughs> that means a lot to him. <laughs> Her name is Hannah. And Hannah is a lady that, when we first meet her, I don't think was flourishing in life. But I want you to come as we read and see what happens for this lady. From verse 8, we'll start the reading. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Hannah, why are you weeping? I've already read that. I need to get a larger print Bible. Memo to self. Why are you downhearted? That was in the Amplified. Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once they had... Finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up 
Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. She made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all his days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. And she kept on what? Praying to the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. So Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were not moving, but her voice, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've, been drink I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And Eli answered, Go in peace. And may the Lord God of Israel grant you what you asked him. And she said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and they went back to their home at Ramah. And Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time Hannah became pregnant, gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Some thoughts from that wonderful Old Testament story that I want to share with you today. And here's the first one. People don't always understand your personal pain or your desperation. Don't be surprised about that. We live on a planet where people are so consumed with themselves and just getting through life that they fail so often to really understand, to even perhaps take the time to stop and understand what you're going through. So don't be surprised. Don't even be disappointed with humanity. People just don't understand what you're going through in some seasons of life. See, this guy Elkanah had two wives. I'm not sure how he did that, but it's a gift. We've met Hannah. There was another one called Peninnah. And she was a special piece of work, this other wife, and she provoked Hannah and she made a life miserable for her. In verse 6 it says, Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival, that's what the other wife was called, it's probably fairly accurate, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Here's, here's a request I have of you, Hope Center people. Can we commit this year to being people that build others up, not put them down? Let's just make a decision right now that one of the hallmarks of our life, of our speech, of this church, of the culture of Hope Center is wherever you go, you feel encouraged. People put courage into you for the fight and the challenges that they'll face in life. His other wife was completely the opposite. Rather than complimenting her, she competed. I, I just feel like we need to get rid of the spirit of competition. I hear competition in conversations. You start talking about something that's happening in your life or family, people feel they instantly need to trump that. Can we just give people the joy of telling us their story? There's a thought. So the other wife obviously didn't know and didn't care. The husband, Elkanah, <laughs> He says to her in verse 8, Hey, why are you downcast? You guys are sensitive. Unbelievable. Why are you crying? <laughs> that works, guys. It works brilliantly. <laughs> why are you crying? Why aren't you eating? Then, then she's struggling to give him an answer. And, and, and guys, 
We just need to learn this thing. Ready? Write this down if you're taking notes, guys. Here, here's a word. Here's a new concept for you. Sensitivity. <laughs> he says to her, hey, aren't I better than 10 sons? We say those things usually just after we've got out of the shower. <laughs> we take our breath. Aren't I better than 10 sons? She, he, he was so shallow. He didn't understand the depth of the pain this lady was in and he, he was just dismissive and pathetic to be quite honest but she goes to church and she hopes oh, the people there will understand and the priest sees her praying but she's not making any sound she's just quietly sitting there and, and her lips are moving no noise is coming out how many know there's a time that you just don't even have the energy to make a sound and the priest, again, so insensitive, sees her and thinks she's drunk, calls her a wicked woman. I wonder, I wonder how many times I've been guilty of judging some people's behavior before I ever know their story. Everyone in this room's got a story. People in this room are going through the greatest time. We're so thrilled for you. Others, it's difficult. God help us be people that just take a little time to understand. Because here's, here's a thought. If you've never heard it before, you might want to write it down. There's always a why behind the what. I say to our team always, over and over again, the issue's seldom the issue. You see, people will react you think, that was, that was such a small thing. Yeah, it was not about the thing. It's about the stuff that's down deep, and that thing is simply a spark that brings a reaction. People's behavior and people's position and posture in life is often due to their, their difficult childhood, physical pain, current financial stress, relational issues, and the list goes on and on and on. No one ever stopped to ask Hannah, why are you feeling so low? They just judged her and responded on the surface. Here's my challenge. If you follow me on social media, you might have seen me make a statement recently. I am committed to seeing and even playing my part in sparking a revolution of kindness. That's what this world needs. Just kindness. We, 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 we just never know what a simple act might spark. We, we never know what a, a kind word might do to bring healing. We, we never know what would happen if, here's a thought, write this down. What would happen if I actually started spending my life considering others before myself? A revolution of kindness where the greatest gift I can give somebody may well be spent, spelt T-I-M-E. Just give them a little time. Just a minute or two. We, we could start practicing in the foyer today. Today. If you're going back to school this year, why don't you be known as the encourager of your class? Why don't you be known as the person that, that actually looks after others? They are kind. I was watching something on a documentary recently. I saw an avalanche and they traced the avalanche back to the start. It was just a small rock that began to roll. A small movement started a huge outcome. Perhaps some small thing that you and I could start could spark a revolution of kindness. This world needs kindness. In a world where people are ugly on social media, in a world where we seem to put on the front page bad news, in, in a world where it's dog eat dog and it's I and me, I just think what we need to do is, is begin to be the, not only the hands and feet of Christ, but his voice and his heart and begin to show people the kindness of a living and loving God. See, here's really good news. There are times that 
No matter how much you try to show kindness, you might feel misunderstood. People don't understand. Hannah can relate to that. But you know what she did? She showed us something. That even when people don't understand, she could go to one who did. Sometimes we say, yeah, I understand. We actually don't. I don't know. I don't understand. I can't relate to somebody that lost a child. I, I can feel, but I, I don't always understand. We can be there, but there are times where we just completely feel overwhelmed. It's when we go to the Lord. Here's the second thought. We've got to be people who not just pray, but pray from the heart, not the head. Let this speak, not just this. In verse 10, we see Hannah, she prayed, and, and I love the way the New King James puts it. She, she prayed to the Lord and she wept in anguish. When you pray from your heart, something comes out that, that's driven by emotion and, and passion and desperation. That doesn't happen when you pray with just your intellect. The lips were moving, it says in verse 13. You couldn't even hear a voice. I'm challenged at the moment by the power of the whispered prayer. Just the whispered prayer. Churches that are like ours and, and uh, believe so much in, in celebration and the person and power of the Holy Spirit and we believe in his fire and we talk about all the stuff that's associated with that, we, we sometimes list, we miss the wonder of silence solitude and that time of just lingering in his presence sometimes it's it's that lingering that comes out of utter devotion you see two lovers walking on the beach they don't have to spend hours talking just enjoy the moment it's what it is with us and our God but there are other times when Silence isn't a matter of just enjoying his presence. It's just I've got nothing else to give. I've been in the battle, been misunderstood. My heart's breaking. I can just barely move my lips, God. But out of my heart, I know you know what I mean. Listen, we don't pray to impress anyone. I'm going to say that again. We don't pray to impress anyone, not people, and certainly not God. How do you impress God? He makes stars. David said his stars are his handiwork. That word is, he, our word is craft. Let's just make a galaxy. How do you impress somebody with just a few flowery words, praying like Shakespeare? Stop it. Be real. Come out of here. I remember a few years ago, my brother-in-law, who we were just a pair of young guys in our 20s trying to work out how to pastor a church. And he and I were asked to go and see a family that had a health issue. And we went over there and we talked with these people and we, we, uh, we prayed for them. And, and as I got the words, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen, out of my lips, this guy, I realized, hadn't had his eyes closed while we are praying. That's quite intimidating when someone's just looking at you when you pray. And I opened my eyes and he said, oh, I love the way you string those words together. I could never pray like that. And John and I drove home and we're laughing to each other. Oh, I love the way we string those words together. And then later on I thought, you know what? You know what that guy was saying? I can't pray like that, so I won't. It's not about your vocab. It's not, listen. It's not even about your doctrine. It's about this. It's about this. Oh, God. God, you need to know. I'm desperate. I, I, I'm not here to, to show you how, how capable I am with, with quoting verses in the different versions and, and quoting the original Greek and the text. No, 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 no. Listen, when my boys were growing and they came to me, they didn't come to impress me. They just came to get my attention and get what they needed. And there are times that we as God's kids just need to come to him and get his attention and get what we need. Oh, God. 
I love how the psalmist David put it, Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the ends of the earth will I cry to you. Listen to this. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. When my heart is overwhelmed. You know, there there are times for celebration. There's times for declaration. There's also times to be desperate. Desperate before God. Hear my cry. Tend to my prayer. God, my heart is overwhelmed. I don't know what to do with this problem. I don't know what to do with this massive challenge. I don't know what to do with this, this, this darkness that seems to flood my soul. I'm crying, God, I'm overwhelmed. But you know what? That psalm's only got a half a dozen verses or so in it. Psalm 61, worth reading. As he comes to that point of saying, God, I'm going to seek you, he, he quickly moves from, I'm overwhelmed, to I'm, I'm going to abide in your presence. I'm going to serve you all the days of my life. And the guy that starts the psalm overwhelmed finishes making a decision, I'm going to sing praises to you. That's what happens when something shifts from desperation in his presence and I roll my pain and my problems over to you. Pray from the heart. And here's the third thought. Pray until you get your breakthrough. Verse 17. The priest says, after she says, listen, I'm a woman, I've been in great anguish and grief. Eli says to her now, you go in peace. And may God grant you what you've asked of him. Look at what's happened. All of a sudden, bang, a light's gone on. All of a sudden, a shift has happened. From desperation to breakthrough. Verse 18. She says, may the Lord... May, may, this, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And she went her way. This is the woman that was desperate. This is the woman that was praying in anguish, in bitterness of soul, who wouldn't eat, who couldn't sleep. This is what she says now. It says, may, may we find favor in your eyes. And she went her way and ate something. And her face was no longer downcast. Many people in this room will know what I mean when I say, There comes a point in time that you know you've got your miracle. You know it in your heart before you see it with your eyes. You just know. And when that's happened, see, people, again, I say people don't know what you're going through. They don't know that you're in deep pain. They don't know that you've got a broken heart. And, and, and they can't quite get why you're reacting and you're responding certain ways. And, but you get before the presence of God and prophetically something begins to happen, you know you've got your miracle, something shifted in your heart, you've seen something in the spirit, and you're already celebrating the victory long before it even happens because you know you've got a God that's true, you know, I've got a God who's good, he's going to do what he said, something's happened in your heart, and there's a shift, and, and people that didn't understand you when you're sad don't understand you now when you're happy. Because you've moved from petition to thanksgiving. Because you know that you know the miracle's on its way. Say it with me. The miracle's on its way. Say it again. You've got to believe it. You've got to believe it. And so we begin to thank him. Because faith has got substance. Because we know that why we already believe that we, what we hope for has already happened. But you, that you don't start there. This is where some teaching goes a little wrong, where we tell people, just claim it and start thanking it back then. You don't claim it until you know you've got your breakthrough. That's when you start thanking him. Until then, we intercede. Until then, we fast. Until then, we seek him. Until then, we pray in the spirit. Until then, we pray with the understanding. We pray, we pray, we pray without ceasing. That's when the shift happens. Pray continually. Pray without ceasing. You know, last year we put a word over our ministry. You might remember it. It's still up there in most of our buildings. It says breakthrough. 
We've got story after story. I read so many of them. People have said, you know, I got our breakthrough. This happened for us and God provided there and healing happened. It's wonderful. And we celebrate that. But some people haven't had that miracle yet. Hasn't happened. So regardless if your miracles happen or if regardless if it hasn't yet, if your breakthroughs happen or it hasn't happened yet, can we just commit to being people who pray? Have you heard the challenge today? We need to... We need to... We need to pray. Pray continually. So here's what I'm asking you to do. As from tomorrow week, Monday, January 29... I'm asking you to join us on a journey of prayer. Our church has done this now for the last few years. We usually start a little later. Usually start mid-February. We've kind of, at times, we've linked into the whole, you know, traditional church's approach with Lent. However, I feel the need to be on the front foot in prayer earlier. I feel the need to stand with thousands of churches. Many of you in this church know that I have the joy of leading a group called the Australian Christian Churches, and we've called well over a thousand churches in our movement to spend three weeks in prayer. But we're not the only movement doing it. I I love what's happening as we've been seeing various things happening in society and politically and all things lately. Do you know what's happened? Here's what's really good. The church is at the highest level and the greatest level of unity I've ever seen in this nation. We're Protestants and Pentecostals and Catholics. You know what? We're not worrying so much about what divides us. We're gathering around what does unite us. It's the Lordship of Jesus. It's God's heart for a nation that desperately needs to turn to Him. Desperately. So we're going to spend the next three weeks from Monday going to let everybody get back into the, just the whole flow of life and school and work and study and all those various things. going to have your barbecue. We'll let you get your barbecues done on, on uh, the long weekend. And then from Monday, Monday the 29th, we're going to pray for our nation. We're going to pray for the church and we're going to pray for individual needs. Focus prayer for three weeks. The promise of 2 Chronicles 7.14 stirs my heart. The first word of 2 Chronicles 7.14 in almost every version is if. If, my people. Can we read people who respond to the if? My people who call by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face. God said, I'll, I'll hear from heaven. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to heal your land. How many know Australia needs healing? on so many levels, on so many levels. It just needs a spiritual awakening. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for God's plan for the planet, the church. I'm going to pray for people. I don't want this church to have simply a motto on a few signs and brochures that said, because people matter. Hear me, people matter. They matter. They matter more than so much other stuff. They're God's delight and we're going to spend time praying for them and believing for their Hannah type miracle to become a reality so for Lynn and I for the last few years we've done a Daniel fast I tell people if you don't pray it's just a diet though Christmas just saying won't hurt us but it One of my friends said to me a long time ago, it's not what we give up, it's who we turn to. I I really don't care. I genuinely don't care what you change in what you eat, what you watch. Can we just spend more time tuning our hearts towards heaven? Next week, we'll give you a few practical ideas across every one of our ministries. Put some things up on our website give you some guidance just how we can be praying we'll do some corporate prayer meetings at least on a weekly basis some people might choose to fast a day a week do the Daniel fast for 21 days fast lunch or a meal every day take their lunch hour and just rather than do what perhaps they would normally do just find a quiet place 
and utter an hour full of whispered prayers. Perhaps some of us give up television or social media. Can I tell you, that'll be good for your soul. I mean that. Started to do that three or four years ago. Just, just you know what? I, 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 that stuff, it, 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 it comes in here and here and ends up in there and, and sometimes it affects here. And, and, and just a, a season of just none of that. Spending time worshipping him, reading, talking to people, sharing, loving people, loving God. Really, there's so many ways we can do that. I'm going to tell you more about that next, next week or so and jump in and out as you can. There's no rules. There's no regulations. It's just personal conviction that we're going to be people that center Jesus in the heart of the church, in the heart of our lives. Lift him up as Lord over our nation. That'll only happen if we pray without ceasing.